Today I will show you an action, crime, drama film from 2005, titled Lord of War. It's the early 1980s. This is Yuri Orlov, the eldest son of a family of Ukrainian refugees. It is his fake name he used to have to escape the Soviet Union in the 70s. His brother Vitaly. They are fake Jews, on the other hand their father was more Jewish than Jews. Vitaly walks into a restaurant at Brighton Beach called Palace as two would-be assassins holding Kalashnikov rifles walk right behind him, they shoot up the place, then get killed themselves by a Russian mobster, right in front of Yuri. This is when everything started for Yuri. He believes that the constant need for weapons is similar to human need for food and drink, thus he can make a fortune. He got his first submachine gun supplier. It was his first time selling a gun, he had no clue what he was doing and compared it to losing virginity. You don't know what to expect and it happens fast. He is very good at smuggling contraband and persuading people. He chained his first bullet to commemorate his first sale. Vitaly is a drunk, even so, Yuri needs a partner so he chose his brother. Vitaly is hesitant, but without much conviction needed he agrees. A while later they are at an arms sale convention, Yuri is here to find Simeon Weiss, a gun dealer that takes war sides, but Yuri's business proposal to just supply guns to both parties is not worthwhile. Simeon calls Yuri an amateur, that's how their rivalry began. So their only option for now is under the counter gun sale. A while later two brothers get their first big break during the Lebanon War. Yuri made weapon piles that were left after the United Nations withdrew, since it cost more to bring guns back than to buy new. He's selling the guns by kilo, which is possible by bribing Lieutenant Kern. Military wages were no good then, so there wasn't a problem. He is selling guns to both Israeli and Lebanese troops despite witnessing the same weapons being used to commit war crimes and other atrocities. As they are walking and talking about minuscule profits, they are terrified by shots that are directed at Lebanon civilians, almost harming them. They sold Israeli-made Uzis to Muslims, communist-made bullets to fascists. Back at home, we see that Yuri owns a private container for his multiple lives, depending on the region of the world he's visiting. As they are on the ship, Crystal, they are tipped off to authorities, as told by his informant, Yuri commands his crew to quickly change the name of the ship to Kono and the country flag they come from to Denmark. Unfortunately they don't have Denmark flag but with Vitaly's quick thinking they put up a French flag sideways, that became Dutch flag. Since the ship is registered in Netherlands, there should be no issues. Jack Valentine, an idealistic Interpol agent, represents a unique threat to Yuri because he is after glory, not money, and thus cannot be bought off. To lead agents off his case, Yuri's strategy this time was to fill his containers with one-week-old potatoes, which luckily discontinued search attempts. While Yuri is supplying the Colombian drug lord with guns, he doesn't get paid with money, but instead cocaine. He doesn't want to accept it. That escalates into an argument that ends with him being shot. While driving away, they decide to celebrate and numb the pain from the gun wound with the cocaine. That is the wrong thing to do, because his brother is a known addict. As presumed, his brother disappeared with one kilo of cocaine. So Yuri traveled 2,000 miles to find his brother, Vitaly in a boarding house, high and disoriented, mapping the border of Ukraine with cocaine. Yuri sweeps the cocaine off the table, which makes Vitaly lash out at him. Yuri drags his brother to America and sends him to a rehabilitation facility. After giving him his last sniff, they say goodbye and Yuri continues his business alone. From the very childhood Ava Fontaine, the model, was someone Yuri was chasing as his dream woman. So that was his next move, he reserved the whole hotel and booked her for a fake photoshoot, so that they would be the only ones there. After getting to know each other, Ava says that there are no flights back to Miami until Thursday. Of course Yuri knows this so he offers Ava a flight on his private jet. He uses most of his wealth just to deceive her and prove to her he is anything but poor. He even painted a plane with his family name just so it seems that he owns the plane. A few charming lines later, Ava feels like fate brought them together, subsequently they get married and have a son. Skip another few years, it's 1991. The Cold War of the Soviet Union is over, Yuri is overjoyed since they've been having financial issues for some time. Now he can get back into the business, he is more overjoyed from the end of Cold War, than learning that his son just walked for the first time, which in fact upsets Ava. Vitaly is seen walking drunk into Yuri's apartment, upsetting the whole family, so he is sent back into rehab. Following recent news Yuri goes to his uncle in Ukraine. He is talking with his uncle, General Dmitry who oversees weapon distribution. He is hesitant to sell guns to Yuri, because how can he report missing guns to higher-ups? Yuri says that no one cares about the guns they have anymore and he has no one to report to. Since Moscow now is a foreign country and no one has taken over in Ukraine, that convinces the general. 
Huge weapon stockpots are seen. 40,000 Kalashnikovs are in stock. But Yuri suggests to change that number to 10,000 and no one would even know it. That's how Yuri got his hands on the biggest weapon stockpile in his life, even tanks and helicopters. And that's where his longtime rival, Simeon, steps in. They are having dinner and Yuri learns that Simeon does not operate well in chaotic conditions, which is where Yuri himself thrives. When Simeon hints at working together, Yuri calls him an amateur and that they should work separately, repaying for declining him all those years ago. When Yuri is loading the ships with weapons, Agent Valentine comes back in the picture. Dimitri says that Yuri is too greedy. Loading military helicopters on ships for transport is a major violation. So Yuri does what he does best, changes the military helicopter to look like a rescue helicopter. As Valentine comes to Yuri he is not surprised to see him, always at the wrong place, at the right time. With all the guns pointed at Yuri, he calmly explains to Valentine that all the weapons and vehicles comply with Europe trade standards, and he cannot do anything about it, except be suspicious, and suspicion is not constituted as a crime. After having an exclusive card gifted to him by Yuri, General Dimitri is calling himself the luckiest man alive. Unfortunately when he steps into the car, it blows up, which devastates Yuri. Despite General's death, the deal still goes through, and is marked as the biggest illegal arms trade of the 20th century. Yuri expands his business to Africa, the largest arms consumers there are. There he meets Andre Baptist, American educated, self-declared president of Monrovia, a ruthless dictator who's engaged in a brutal war in Liberia. Andre Jr., Baptist's son, with the golden AK-47 demands that Yuri comes and meets his father. After a decline from Yuri, he is told that it's not an option. At Baptist's stronghold, Yuri is talking about guns, when Baptist kills one of his soldiers right before his eyes for disrespecting him. Yuri yells at Baptist, guns get pointed at Yuri, but before things escalate, he says that Baptist has to buy the gun, as if pointing out that he is furious not because of him killing his soldier, but using a gun he hasn't paid for yet, to do so. This humors Baptist, and he accepts Yuri as his arms dealer. Andre Jr. drives Yuri outside town to a supposedly two-star hotel, and has a present from his father. The present is two beautiful women. Yuri tries to call it off, since one in four people in Monrovia have AIDS. They are trying their best to seduce Yuri, but he still asks them to leave. Baptist shows how fond he is of his army of kids. His country isn't rich, so he can't pay him in money, but he is ready to pay him in timber or blood diamonds. Yuri takes the diamonds. Yuri knows that Baptist wants to go offensive, so he suggests delaying his attack for a week, offering him his armored personnel carriers he got from Ukraine, as that would reduce his casualties exponentially. It is the late 90s and Yuri's wealth has caught up and even surpassed his lies to Ava. Ava started painting and an anonymous patron bought a painting of hers. She was ecstatic about it, but didn't know that the anonymous patron was Yuri. Vitaly is seen doing better, but looks jealous of Yuri. Vitaly asks if Ava knows about Yuri's line of work, which he denies. Ava shouldn't know anything about his multiple lives, at the same time he was wondering how much Ava really knew and how much she chose to ignore. Not everything is always smooth sailing for Yuri, there are setbacks, like sending guns to the country that started peace talks and entered a truce, it's not called gun running for nothing, you have to be fast on your feet. New times come, and a new breed of cop is needed. Yuri is being investigated by the FBI, so he is constantly on the lookout. To lose the helicopter that is giving chase, he gets out of his limousine and gets into a taxi, to drive to his container. As he stores another one of his wife's paintings, he gets a call from her, telling him there are men going through their garbage and asking him if there is something she should be worried about. Yuri dismisses her, telling that everything is fine and he loves her. Valentine has put together a paper containing information about Yuri's next move. At this point Yuri is the best death merchant alive. He doesn't own a plane, he owns a whole fleet. Most trips Yuri has phony paperwork, but he isn't overly concerned. There are hardly any radars over Africa, and even fewer people to watch them. Unfortunately during one flight to Africa in 2001, Yuri's plane is intercepted by Valentine and, after an array of bullets he is forced to land. Yuri escapes arrest by landing in a remote area and giving away all of his cargo to locals, offering it as free samples, leaving no evidence to charge him for. As one of the locals tries to kill Yuri, noting that people disappear there all the time, he is dissuaded by Valentine, saying he is going to get what's coming to him. Valentine decides to hold Yuri detained for 24 hours, it's in his right, so that Yuri has less time to do his crimes. Valentine didn't guard Yuri, he knew he had nowhere to go, or he hoped that locals would tear him apart but they were too busy with the plane. Upon returning to his hotel, Yuri is shocked to see Baptist, his son and Simeon, who is tied to a chair. Baptist offers Yuri to kill Simeon, 
He is his competitor and also killed his uncle. Yuri doesn't want to kill him, but also refuses to let him go. So as a bonding experience Baptist places a gun in Yuri's hand, still giving him a chance to say stop. Yuri is silent and Simeon is shot dead. That night Yuri tried cocaine mixed with gunpowder, which is called brown brown, for the first time. It is said that it makes you do anything. Barely conscious, he sees a woman on him and asks if she is infected. Without response she leaves. Experiencing hallucinations of Simeon and basically wanting to die, as one of guards tries to shoot at Yuri, the gun misfires, twice. Even hyenas he sees in the desert walk away from him. He starts to feel cursed. Curse of invincibility. Valentine tells Ava her husband is an arms dealer, prompting her to confront him, even set him up. He tries to persuade her telling that Yuri is exactly the kind of a man who is responsible for the death of her parents, selling illegal firearms. Upon returning home, Ava tells Yuri she can't wear the clothes, can't wear the jewelry, can't drive the car or live in this house, everything has blood on it. Yuri admits to selling guns, Ava pleads him to stop, that they have enough. For Yuri it's not about the money, he is just good at it, so Ava gives him an ultimatum, her or his arms trade. To please his wife, Yuri tries to legitimize his business with timber sales, even Valentine gets confused by tapping on his calls. Yuri soon becomes frustrated with the difficulties and lower earnings of honest work, but still, he made a promise to Ava. Baptist comes to America for peace talks with the United Nations. Before they begin he gives Yuri a visit, hoping to strike another deal. Yuri refuses at first, but after being offered the largest payday of his career, a stash of diamonds, Yuri goes back to crime one last time. On the day of his departure, he explains the situation to his wife, and asks if she trusts him. She lies without flinching and Yuri suspects it. Ava tells Yuri, to expose his lies, Yuri leads her right to his container containing his multiple lives. As she unlocks it, she is devastated by its content. Before departing to Liberia, Yuri visits his brother Vitaly asking him for assistance with a major deal. Reluctantly, Vitaly agrees. After they land, Baptist says that the delivery will be done only after they deliver the guns to his neighbors to the west, Sierra Leone, to the freedom fighters. At the business table, Vitaly is checking the camp, after seeing one woman being gutted for running after her son, Vitaly pleads with Yuri to abandon the deal, but Yuri refuses knowing that Baptist men will kill them for refusing to hand over the guns. Vitaly is disgusted by his brother, unable to stomach the guilt. Vitaly steals a pair of grenades and uses them to destroy a truck full of weapons, accidentally killing Andre Jr. He is gunned down, and while Yuri is spared due to his relationship with Baptist, he only receives half of the diamonds. Evil prevails when good men fail to act. What they ought to say is evil prevails. Yuri pays $20 to a Monrovian doctor to remove bullets from his brother's corpse and write a bogus death certificate. He should have paid more. The first bullet that lands Yuri in jail was found under his dead brother's rib. As he is trying to get a hold of Ava, she is leaving the house for good. When he tries to reconcile with his parents, his mother picks the phone and says that both of his sons died that day. While in custody and talking with Valentine, he reveals it was his wife who led them to the prize. It's not her fault. She was just easier to follow than Yuri is. Yuri tells Valentine to enjoy it, tell him everything he wants to tell him, because he doesn't have long. Valentine tells him that he doesn't appreciate the seriousness of the situation, that he will spend the next 10 years of his life just going from jail cell to courtroom before starting to serve his sentence. Yuri is unfazed saying my family has disowned me, my wife and son have left me, my brother is dead. He fully appreciates the seriousness of the situation. He then proceeds to explain him what exactly will happen. Then a man will come who outranks Valentine, he will compliment him on his job well done, and then he will tell Valentine that he is to be released, because that while he may be a criminal, the United States government is willing to turn a blind eye to his crimes, since most of his weapons end up in the hands of their allies, who they cannot be seen publicly supplying with arms. Valentine then hears a knock at the door and realizes that Yuri is right, but before walking away, he says I would tell you to go to hell, but I think you're already there. Yuri just gets back to what he does best, being an arms dealer. Thank you for watching.